This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Starting today's show is K-State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth with information about the early season pest winter grain mites. He also shares about cicadas and why they shouldn't impact crops. Sarah Lancaster, K-State weed specialist, keeps the show rolling by discussing dicamba and what she recommends producers do as they wait to see what happens in the courts. Kansas State University Distinguished Professor of Agronomy Chuck Rice completes today's show by saying one of the greatest challenges we face is gardening for a changing climate. We pass along some of his thoughts from the latest K-State Garden Hour. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Thursday show discussing early season pests. And then to talk about it, we're joined by K-State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Anytime. Jeff, today discussing winter grain mites. And first, can you give us a little bit of background information about them? You know, it seems early in the year, but every year is a little bit different weather-wise, especially in Kansas. Winter grain mites, as the name implies, do best in winter or during cool, cold conditions. Um, So just a brief history about the winter grain mites. We haven't had big problems in recent years, but every year we have a few here and there. The thing about winter grain mites, they come around, they're, they're the last pest we have in wheat in the fall and generally the first one we have in wheat going into the spring. Because as the name implies, they like cool weather. Anytime the temperature's, oh, between 35 and 50 degrees, winter grain mites are active. Now, again, once it gets below 30, 25, something like that, they start laying eggs, and they lay eggs in the fall. That's where they are right now. They're in the egg stage for the most part. The winter grain mites are more troublesome in no-till or minimum-till fields because the mites do better in the residue and the, you know, on the soil. That's where they prefer to lay eggs, so the eggs seem to do better in residue in the soil or, you know, at least loose sandy soil also. So last fall, November, early December, the mite population dwindled and they started laying eggs. The eggs are right now in the soil. They're in the residue. They will soon start hatching, and that's what everybody's concerned about because as long as the wheat is in dormancy, there's nothing to worry about, and whether it's you – know, I get the calls about wheat and alfalfa. As long as they're still in dormancy, it doesn't matter. The pest feeding is not going to bother it. So make sure it has broken dormancy before you even think about trying to treat them. But anyway, winter grain mites are in the egg stage right now. They will start hatching gently mid to late February, early March. Again, it depends on the weather. The winter grain mite is very tiny. You can see it without magnification. Uh, but it's not easily seen without magnification. They feed at night or on cloudy days. So if if the sun's out, they're going to drop off the plant or they're going to crawl down the plant. They're going to get into the residue or they're going to get into the loose soil around the plant. That's where they're going to spend the day. If the temperatures don't drop below much below 30 degrees at night, they will feed at night. If it's below that, they won't do any feeding. As I said, they're very small. They will actually, they suck the juice out of the plant cell by cell. So the mites, as they crawl up the plant, they get up to the leaves. Generally, the newer, more sucking up, more tender leaves, that's where the moisture is. They will, you know, start uh, sucking the juice out of individual cells. If there are enough mites and they fed it long enough, they might turn the plants kind of a silvery color. So if you do have a winter grain mite infestation, a substantial infestation, if you drive out in your field, you can see the difference between where the mites are feeding on the wheat versus where they aren't feeding. Generally, you know, the fields that are minimum till are worse. Not not always because a lot of times they, they get in brome. They'll get in the other grasses too. So if you have brome waterways or, you know, brome fields adjacent to it, they can be moving in from that area also. Remember, they're moving into the wheat because the wheat's probably going to be the first thing that breaks dormancy for them to feed on. They're looking for that substance inside those cells. So, like I said, if you have continuous wheat fields, you're probably going to have more of a problem than if you change it out every year. But the winter grain mites, 
they'll start feeding. They'll start – they won't produce any more than they're already there based upon the egg count. As the nymphs get larger, they feed more, so they'll start taking the juice out of more cells. When it's most evident is when it's dry. Under dry conditions, winter grain mites can cause concern. Whether they actually cause a yield reduction or not, we don't have a lot of data to that effect. We have a lot of data showing that you can control winter grain mites. We have some data to show that once the winter grain mites start feeding, if you get a substantial rain or big snow or sleet storm or anything, remember, we're talking late winter, early spring, right? That will pretty much clean the winter grain mites off your wheat, so you won't have a problem. So keep that in mind. What they're going to cause concern on is wheat that is struggling for moisture because they're competing for the moisture for the plant. So in in wheat that's, you know, drought affected, which we have some around the state still. I know we had good rains in the fall and snow going into it. We've had some this winter. It's doing a lot better, but we still have some areas that are relatively dry. And if we don't get more moisture between now and, oh, what, mid-March, whenever the wheat breaks dormancy and the winter grain mites are out actively feeding, that's when we could get a lot of concern, at least, about winter grain mite feeding. The guys are out looking at their wheat. They don't like to see it go, what they always say, it's going backwards. You know, it's not growing like the non-infested wheat does just because the mites are out there competing for the moisture. So it can be a real problem. However, like I said, we've sprayed it in years past. Most of the time when we put out an insecticide trial or a miticide trial, we'll get a rain. So the rain washes them off. The insecticides or the miticides, they work well. They'll control the uh, winter grain mites, but it's whether they're actually going to go ahead and cause yield reduction is the question. What is that threshold for treating winter grain mites? If you do decide to treat, I have a hard time recommending treating for winter grain mites. Again, if it's a dry spring, dry winter in your area, it's relatively warm, the plants are struggling, and you go out and you have maybe a 1,000 mites per row foot, you think that sounds like a lot, right? They're really tiny. Or if you got, you know, 50 to 100 per leaf uh, on the plants, again, you're not going to see them during the day. If you go out during the day to sample, they're going to fall off the plant or they're going to crawl down the plant. So you're going to have to look in the soil. If you're out looking, go out at night. If you want to sample the plant itself, wear a little headlamp. You'll be surprised, not pleasantly, about how many mites are actually on the plants. Sometimes we've gone out to look and the plants just look furry with the little mites. These winter grain mites have a dark body, black, dark brown body with very distinctive orange, red legs. Two front legs are a little bit longer, but that's hard to tell just without magnification. They also have a little red anal pore or a little red spot on their on top of their abdomen. So they're very distinctive. And are there any other early season pests that maybe producers might want to keep an eye out for right now? Right now, army cutworms. I've gotten some calls about army cutworms. Going into the fall, I got calls about army cutworms. To me, the army cutworm is a really neat insect because they, over summer, in the Rocky Mountains, and then they fly back here last fall, you know, to lay eggs. The reason I've gotten quite a few calls, I think, already this year is because, if you'll recall, last year, in 2023, around Memorial Weekend, uh, we were getting a lot of calls, and there were a lot of problems with what they call Miller moths. The Miller moth is the adult stage of the Army cutworm. Usually in Kansas, the adult stage is right around Memorial Weekend. You can pretty well count on it one week either way based upon the temperature of Memorial Weekend. And then they all head west, and they over summer up in the mountains. And then in August, early September, they all fly back, and they lay eggs as they come. And they get back to Kansas to about, Oh, maybe 75 highway, highway 75 to around Topeka or maybe, you know, about to Manhattan, and they no more eggs. But they'll be, lay eggs in wheat and alfalfa in the fall because those are the two crops that are out there in the fall. So that's something that's going to – we're going to see more and more of in the next month or two, uh, more feeding in alfalfa and wheat if you have an army cutworm infestation. Real quick, wanting to touch on cicadas, not really something that ag producers should be worrying about? Cicadas. Yeah, I've gotten a f- couple of calls about cicadas. Cicadas, in my opinion, are really kind of neat. A lot of times they're called locusts, 
which is n- not what they are. Locust is actually a migratory grasshopper. I don't know where that name came from. But these are cicadas are the little insects that make that buzzing noise in the summer. They climb up trees, and you'll see the cast skin on the tree, which the kids like. But apparently this year, 2024, there are two broods that are supposed to emerge right around the same time, the 13-year and the 17-year periodical cicada. Now, there are many different broods of cicadas around the country, and it depends on where you are exactly as to which brood you're going to have emerge and how many of them. I think maybe the majority or larger brood emergence is going to occur a little bit south of us, a little bit east of us. They really don't cause a problem in agriculture because those adults crawl up a tree. They will insert the eggs into a little limb of a tree. They can sometimes cause a problem in small limbs and on fruit trees or something. But for the most part, they lay their eggs as the eggs hatch. The nymphs drop down to the ground, crawl into the, into the soil, and start feeding on roots of some sort of a tree or a shrub or something. So we don't really have that problem in agriculture. But maybe some homeowners or uh, uh, some horticulture people, you know, trying to grow trees, they might have a problem if this year these two broods come out in a big way in some areas of the state. But for the most part, they're mostly just kind of a nuisance because of their, I don't know what you call it, buzzing or uh, the noise they make. But other than that, uh, they're probably not going to be a problem to people in agriculture. Just an anomaly, I guess. Uh, we'll see what happens. That was K-State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Thursday show discussing dicamba. And then to talk about it, we're joined by K-State weed specialist, Sarah Lancaster. Sarah, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me on, Shelby. Sarah, dicamba has been in the news quite a bit this past weekend. Why is that? So in the middle of last week, Shelby, the U.S. District Court in Arizona issued a ruling that said the EPA violated some requirements of FIFRA. So FIFRA is the act that dates back to the 1940s that allows the federal government to register pesticides. So that's the really bad news. The one tiny bit of maybe encouraging news in that ruling, from my perspective, Shelby, is that the court did not find the EPA was in violation of any Endangered Species Act compliance considerations that were also part of the suit. So That, I think, bodes well for future registrations. So if there is a a little bit of good news there, I think that 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 is it. So what does this news mean for our ag producers? Yeah, so basically what that means from a weed management perspective, Shelby, is that today on February 13th, while we're sitting here talking, that we do not have legal labels for Extendamax, Ingenia, or Tavium. It's sort of like those labels just don't exist right now. So we know that there's some different ways the EPA could respond. Um, We also know that the EPA and the companies and all the various farm advocacy groups are working on responses to this court ruling. The unfortunate thing, and, and to be honest, Shelby, the reason I've been sort of reluctant to say a whole lot about this publicly is just that we don't know what that response is going to be. We don't know how then the court's going to respond to that. So, you know, right now, all we can say is that those three products are not legally registered. Is this something then that producers maybe need to be thinking about, okay, what else can I do? I think so. I think it's time. I don't think it's time to enact any worst case scenario strategies, but I do think it's time for guys to start planning their worst case scenario strategies. And by worst case scenario, I mean that through whatever series of events, we end up without labels for those three products this year. So some things they could do, right? Maybe from a achieving the best weed control possible scenario, it might be thinking about if they have the flexibility with their suppliers to switch 
into a different soybean production system, a different herbicide resistant trait package in their soybeans. And so Enlist is obviously the one that's going to come to mind first there. Um, But if farmers don't have that option, again, I'm not saying it's time to to pull the trigger and and send those beans right back. Um, Obviously, the company folks and the folks in the commodity organizations are fairly optimistic here in the conversations that I've had, but that would be an option. So in the meantime, I think what I would encourage folks to do is think about what happens if we get the beans in the ground, the extended soybeans in the ground, and we have to kind of scramble mid-season for our post-emergence weed control. And so things that I have been talking about on the weed school circuit this week are the need to you know, level up your residual herbicide program. So, you know, if you're using a solid kind of two herbicide combination at planting, step that up and add that third residual herbicide and and think about, you know, what do you want your overlapping residual herbicide programs to look like? Uh, The second point there would be to do anything you can to encourage canopy cover, right? That kind of goes without saying our farmers are pretty much doing that every year anyway. And then, as we think about herbicide options, we've got a couple of things going on here. We've got extend soybeans that are still on the market, and then we have extend flex soybeans, right? So it's important that folks are aware of the distinction between those two types of dicamba tolerant soybeans. So in the extend system, those beans are only resistant to dicamba and glyphosate. So really, when we think about that, we're we're down to using group 14 herbicides. So that would be products like Reflex or Cobra, Shelby. Um, a couple of you know negatives to that. One, we know we have a lot of crop response with those. Two, we know that weed coverage and weed size are very important for decent control with those products. And number three, we know we have areas of the state where we do have There's conversations about group 14 resistance in some of these Palmer Amaranth populations. We know we have documented group 14 resistance in water hemp. So lots of concerns there. Uh, One thing to consider is to pull out some of these product labels and see if we have some hooded sprayer applications or hooded sprayer labels that might allow us to use some alternative chemistries and protect the crop that way, but still try to get good weed control. So that's one sort of line of thinking for those extend products. The other side of this, Shelby, would be the extend flex system, where we do have the option of using Liberty post-emergence, okay? Okay. So with Liberty, we know that heat and humidity are our friends, that the product is going to work better in conditions with high heat and high humidity. We know that weed size and spray coverage are absolutely important because this is a contact herbicide. And the other thing I would say is that there is some evidence in the literature that the combination of Liberty with a PPO inhibitor can result in enhanced pigweed control. So as we think about how to maximize those Liberty applications in the season, that may be something for folks to consider this idea of a Liberty plus a reflex or Cobra type of product. So, you know, those from a practical standpoint, that's kind of kind of where we're at. Unfortunately, Shelby, none of them are really fantastic options, um, but that is kind of how I'm encouraging folks to start thinking. Um, again, I would say the unfortunate side of this whole deal is, is this period of uncertainty, right? We just don't know what the response is going to be to this court decision. As soon as we get a response, we will uh, do our best to get back on this program and, and send information out uh, so folks kind of know what's going on. But right now, we're, we're kind of in, you know, in a little bit of limbo here trying to, to not make rash decisions, but also be prepared for that worst case scenario. Really the time then just to write down a game plan and know if this is what happens, this is what I'm going to do to counteract that, hopefully. Yeah, I think that's that's the thing, right? So, you know, a couple things could happen. EPA could allow use of existing stocks, in which case it's it's game on, right? Nothing really changes. Um, EPA could make that decision and then have that decision overruled, right? Which to me, that's going to be probably the worst case scenario. Uh, the other thing that could happen is that we could just say the EPA is going to abide by this and, and not 
try to change anything. Um, at least if that happens soon enough, guys can, can respond, right? So, you know, we had the same similar situation back in 2020. The courts issued a vacature of the, the labels of these products. And that whole decision, I was trying to make sense out of the legal documents around this case, Shelby. And what I got out of it is that that 2020 decision is really, and the, the EPA's response to that, is really playing into this decision as well. So it's kind of like the saga just keeps dragging out for our farmers. Um, but, you know, we've had this before and that ruling came down like the first week in June, right? So guys were locked in 100%. That is the worst case scenario. In this case, would we have rather had this news in, you know, October, November, December? Absolutely. Uh, but we do still have some time uh, to pivot if, if we need to. So it, it's definitely not good news for our farmers who are operating in the extend and extend flex systems, but it's, it's, you know, the hand we've been dealt and we're going to do the best we can to get through it. And just a reminder, this isn't just Kansas producers. This is producers everywhere that are using dicamba, correct? That's right. It's soybean and cotton farmers, you know, really across the entire, you know, soybean and cotton producing regions of the United States that have been affected by this Shelby. So again, there's lots of voices in this space right now, kind of behind the scenes, trying to get to a resolution. So I just encourage our farmers to, to sit tight for a little bit, but start making, making those mental preparations of what they're going to do. Sarah, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and share with us some perspective for Dicamba. Thanks for having me on, Shelby. I appreciate your help in getting information out. That was Kansas State University Wheat Specialist Sarah Lancaster. You can read more on this topic from the Kansas Department of Agriculture as they put out a news release titled Vacated Registration of Dicamba Products Impacts Kansas Agriculture. Their website is agriculture.ks.gov, and I will link that release in today's show notes on agtoday.net. Also, just a reminder that the K-State Research and Extension Bookstore is back up and running. You can find the bookstore at bookstore.ksre.ksu.edu. And some publications that we've talked about recently that you might want to go ahead and check out is the Soil Test Interpretations and Fertilizer Recommendations that we talked about with Dorvar Weez Diaz. And to find it, you can search MF2586. Also, you might want to take a look at the 2024 Chemical Weed Guide, which we talked about with Sarah Lancaster, and you can find it by searching SRP1183. I will link both of these in today's show notes. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. Kansas State University Distinguished Professor of Agronomy Chuck Rice says one of the next greatest challenges facing us is gardening for a changing climate. During the February KC Garden Hour, Rice discussed the challenges that we face with increasing global temperatures and possible solutions, which he refers to as climate smart gardening. First of all, we have to understand a little bit about climate change, what it is and what it is not. Since about 1970s or so, there's been a considerable increase in our global temperatures. We're talking about climate, not weather. The difference between climate is that we're looking at longer term patterns. Weather is what happens day to day or week to week. Climate is more on a decades or 10 year time scales. It's interesting. I work in row crop agriculture and native prairies, but a lot of the things I discuss for our large fields, corn, wheat, soybean, cotton, really translate to gardens. I'm a soil scientist, I'm biased, but really I think soil health is really key. It provides some of the buffer, the resiliency against those extreme events, both water and heat. We can also do less tillage of the gardens, and we don't necessarily need to, to till, and, and there's reasons for that. The use of cover crops during the winter, keeping that soil covered, that adds biomass, improves the soil health, recycles nutrients. Mulch is absolutely critical. Composting, not tilling soil to till, will break up those soil particles and expose 
uh, the organic matter just destroy the soil structure. But adding plant material or organic material to the soil, to the garden, is one way to do that. And we have uh, some long-term research showing the benefits of adding compost. By adding compost, whether it's food waste, adding manure, again, adding mulch to that soil surface, you can improve the soil structure. And we don't have to till that material in. I got in my own garden flower beds. I have mulch on the surface that suppresses weeds, so I don't have to go out and weed as much, but I'm improving my soil. And it also retains that moisture. I'm preventing that layer of compost or mulch on the surface is reducing evaporation. So now I'm making more effective use of that precipitation or irrigation. The other benefits of mulch is that it cools the soil. So that bare soil surface heats up, that affects microbial activity, but also hampers the roots. Putting the compost on the surface, you don't have to till it in. Use that organic layer to create the benefits of, of water savings. Plant selection, looking at one way to make more effective use of the water, more heat tolerance is perennials. Perennials have developed a deep root system, diversity of roots going down deep. Not only is it capturing water and extracting water from deeper in the soil during those dry periods, but it's also recycling nutrients, pulling nutrients that have moved down the soil, deep in the profile and moving up near the soil surface. So whether it's cultivated annual plants that might have deep root systems, but particularly native plants have evolved with those root systems. Looking at annuals, we need to select cultivars that are more heat tolerant, drought tolerant. Plant diversity and rotation, having multiple plants in there. So it harbors beneficial plants, pollinators, but also insects that will feed on some of the negative paths that affect plant growth. And so having that diversity is really important to support the beneficial plants as well. Watering, don't water the atmosphere. It's better to use uh, drip irrigation to get it onto the soil surface, into the soil, rather than atmosphere. Sprinkler irrigation depends on the sprinkler, but a lot of it's going to be evaporated, so it's less efficient. That's Kansas State University Distinguished Professor of Agronomy Chuck Rice, who specializes in soil microbiology, carbon cycling, and climate change. He was the featured speaker for February's K-State Garden Hour. To view the full webinar, search for K-State Garden Hour. For more information on best practices for gardening, contact your local extension office. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network. We'll be right back.